Say, Lord, your word says this. I'm not 100% sure of it, but I'm going to step out in faith and I'm, I'm going to trust you. And then I'm going to see if you're going to come through for me or not. And when God comes through for you, now you know, okay, he is trustworthy in this thing. This certain area or whatever it is that you're trusting him for. But if you don't step out in faith <coughs> and your comfort zone into that block, and God can't come through for you because you're still standing here. You see what I'm saying? Right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you have to have some degree of faith and you have to make a choice to say, all right, your word says this, now I'm going to give it a bash. I've only got this little bit of faith, but it's all I've got, so here I go. Let me check. Because you say you're faithful and true. So it is by God's fruit, right, that you judge Him. Am I right? Does that make sense? So now, what does God say? God says that it's by your fruit that I will judge you. Because talk is cheap, man. We all master manipulators from where we come from. Ons kan een hond uit de bos uitpraten. We we can talk a dog out of a bush. This is a silly old gun saying, right? Isn't it? So it's by our fruit because talk is cheap. I mean, we can say one thing to get whatever we want through manipulation. But it is me watching you and seeing how you act that I am going to make a definition of who you are it's by what you say and what you do. Same with God, right? So without the testing, if I can put it that way, there is no proof. Alright? So I can talk the talk. I can say I'm a Christian, I, you know, I, I, do, I do this and I, I, I send money to orphans and I visit widows and I visit people in jail and I'm a good guy. 
But if I don't see you doing it, is it true? It's the same thing as saying, if a tree falls over in the forest and there's no one there to see it, did the tree really fall over? There's no proof of it, unless you go and see the tree lying down, then the tree fell over. See what I'm saying? So it's meaningless without a work. Now, Satan knows that if he can confuse your mind as far as your God is concerned, there'll be no fruit. Because if I'm confused about what is right and wrong, am I going to do right? Isn't right making a choice? You get your information, you gather your information, you process your information, you decide what is, is going to be the best outcome out of the situation, and you decide this is the course of action I'm going to take, and you step out and you do it. You do the right thing. To get a result from it. Is that not so? We've all been wishy-washy our whole lives. 49 years worth. Blow here, blow there, more money here, ooh, yes, ooh, dream, ooh, promise, ooh, uh, you achieve a lot because you had no game plan. You had no game plan, so you had no course of action, the wind just blew you wherever. Confused mind. Didn't know whether I was a Buddhist, a Sankrit, or Catholic. Achieved nothing. Yes, from the outside, I looked like I achieved success. I had three wives. I had good jobs. You know, I got as far as branch managers of companies. I had houses. So for certain periods of my life, it looked like I was gaining success. But I had one God. And that was drugs. And we know the results of that. At the age of 49, you turn around, you've got nothing, and you are nothing to anybody in this world. You've achieved zero. Now, again, play. confused. Oh, maybe. Oh, 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 oh that looks nice. You're all over the place. Right? You achieve absolutely nothing with a confused mind. So you can put confusion into your mind. So, you've got no more excuse because here's the book. You're here now and here's the book. Today is the day. Right? You've got no more excuse. Because here now you, you know the truth. If I put before you the truth, and the lie. Which one are you going to choose? That's your choice. Alright? So if God comes and He puts his, his thoughts, which are truth, down on paper, and He says, yes, the truth, it's your choice. Am I going to accept this or not? Your choice. There can be no confusion. Right? Because now you've got no more excuse. Who's got an excuse as a guy who's never had this? So he's never had the tools to make a good choice. He can be judged a little less harshly than you who's had this and has refused it or rejected it. Right? Because if you look at this book and you read this book, this book gives you the tools for a successful life. Is that not so? Is there anybody here who disagrees? <coughs> anybody? I mean, you can. I mean, everybody's got a right to an opinion. So do we all agree that this is the blueprint for a successful life? Yes, Alright. So now, if you are unsuccessful at life, whose fault is it? 
It's your own because you haven't followed what the rule book has said. Right? So I buy a washing machine which says, uh, whatever, G5, 5kg. And I go and load it with 10kg's worth of washing in there. And the thing goes, um, 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 and it freaks out and it breaks down. Is it the washing machine's fault? No. Is it the rule book's fault? No. It's you who never took the rule book, read it, and did what it said. See what I'm saying? Now, what do we do? Because we feel bad because we know we're wrong. <coughs> A lot of the time. What do we do? It's called Blanchard. But if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have made that bad choice. Really? Why would an outside thing influence you to do something which you know is wrong? Which is out of line with the rule book. You know what's right. No matter what happens out there, or to you, or somebody does to you, you still know what's right. So why would you blame that? So I'm going to blame the 10 kgs of washing that I put in me for breaking the machine. Is it the washing's fault? It didn't jump in there by itself. You put it in there. So it's actually your fault. Yes, we all know stuff happens. Right? We know that. The Bible tells us that. The rule book tells us that stuff happens. Right? But it is your response to stuff to still do the right thing that is going to get you the better result. So we walk around, we break the rules. We know what's right and wrong because we've all got a conscious now. A chavieta now. A know it in English now. You know it? A chavieta, I know it. That still small voice of God talking to you and saying, don't do it. So we all have that. But sometimes it's not lucky to listen to that because it feels like it's going to cost us a lot more if we listen to it. Am I right? So by doing the wrong thing, we sear the conscience and that little voice gets less and less and less. Right? Excuse me, I'm going to <laughs> so the conscience gets less and less and less, right? Who's fault? Who's fault? Oh, I didn't know any better? It's not an excuse. It's not an excuse. So what I'm trying to get across here this morning is, Read the book, and there'll be no confusion. Why do you think God has given you such a dark book? Because He wants to steal your fun. <laughs> he wants to give you a good life, a prosperous, prosperous life, a happy life. A life of freedom where you don't need to be <coughs> worried about being judged. So there's no fear. And where there's no fear, you can be the best you you can ever be, isn't it? Because now I'm not competing with Tom to be the best computer technician. I am what I am. I'm made to wired for that and I'm doing the best that I possibly can do. I'm satisfied. I'm fulfilled. I don't need to compare myself to karma. And vice versa. Because I'm not karma. As you can see. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? We put all these burdens on ourselves through confusion. Sure. If you know that God has created you for a specific purpose in life, only you can do that. Is that not going to make you feel like you're the man? Eh? Isn't it? You're not going to worry about what uh, a guy tells you or, or Gustav or whoever tells you, is it? Because you know who you are. 
and you're happy. You're jumping out of bed every morning. This is what you were created for. You were created for the 5 kg washing. You're the machine. And you're like, hey, hey, hey I'm a D5. <laughs> <laughs> so it's on board, but yes, you get what I'm saying. Isn't that what we're all striving to become? Then it doesn't really matter if I come and I say, ah, I don't smart you, eh? Yes, like, you know, uh, um, yeah. I don't like your hairstyle, man. You know what I mean? It's immaterial to you whether I like your hairstyle or not because you're happy with your hairstyle. So get over it if you don't like my hairstyle. Isn't it? You're not going to come steal my thunder. See, there's no more confusion because I know what I was created for. And I'm fulfilling my purpose. And God is well pleased with me. Make sense? So we need to know then what God requires of us. Alright, so who here has not accepted the Lord? Anybody? Well, don't raise your hands. Don't raise your hands. We are Deuteronomy 30, right? Mm -hmm. uh, verse number 15. <coughs> See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, to keep His commandments and His statutes, His judgments, that you may live and multiply, that the Lord your God may bless you in the land. Right? So what is God giving you these things for? It's to bless you. Because He knows that if you don't do these things here, you give the enemy a chance to attack you and steal your peace, your joy, and your fulfillment in life. Your purpose in life. There's nothing sadder than a person who has lived a life and has never found out what his purpose was. Because his parents told him that he had to have a good job. So his talent was to be a motor mechanic and so he became a motor mechanic. And he was okay at it. It was just an ability, and so that's what he did for his whole life, and the world told him that he had to supply for his family, and so he had to be a good husband. He didn't, mustn't drink too much Saturday night, go a little bit overboard, that's sharp, don't eat your wife, and go through life by man's rules. There's nothing sadder than that, because he never explored his talent, he never got in connection with God, he never found out that he had other talents, and those talents included writing of books, painting of paintings, new invention which would have empowered the whole world. And he goes to he dies, he goes to he goes to the grave with all the treasure that he had that he never even knew he had. Still in him. He lived by man's rules. And by the way, the world told him, seeking the second holiday house, the second car for his wife. And he was never satisfied, sat on his couch and convinced himself that he was a good guy. Because by worldly standards, he provided a fair living. He never taught his children about God. His children died and went to hell. How good of a father was he? See what I'm saying? God's standards and the world's standards are very, very different. You see what I'm saying? It's sad, isn't it? He never actually enjoyed his life. He lived up to a standard that the world had set and what he thought the world would look at him and say, wow, that's a good man. And that was his reward. That's very really sad. Isn't it? She lived her life as a good housewife. She was always there for her children. She worked 18 hours a day, clothing, feeding, doing homework, etc., etc., driving them to wherever, hockey and tennis, etc., etc. Was always there for her husband. Whenever he needed her, she would make herself available, whether she felt like it or not. Did her, did her, and then she broke cookies for them, and she 
And one day she woke up, she was 75, and she discovered that she had this penchant for painting, which she never even knew she had. But she was now so old that she only had a year of life left. So she could give the world three paintings. What a sad epitaph of her life. So she convinced herself that this was the best that she could have. She never got in connection with God and she never had the joy of the Lord. She never enjoyed the life that she actually had. She just did what the world told her was what a good housewife would do. What a sad life. And her kids went to her. <coughs> Imagine that. Right? That's a lie, isn't it? To a certain extent. Isn't it? You lived a lie. But convince yourself you are okay because you judge yourself by other people's standards. And other people's standards are my love. But I tell you something. If you connect to the Lord and find out what your purpose is, you will make a difference in this world. You will. Of course, you've got the creator of the universe inside of you. You cannot but make a difference in this world. You'll have challenges. But you'll walk a wide path. you walk a wide path and you'll make a difference. Because this world is dark and you've got light in you. You must make a difference. <coughs> All right, so Matthew 6, 19. It says in, in verse 19, There are four heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. So choose life, right, in order that you may live, you and your descendants. Choose. Stop being confused, guys. Who are you going to serve? There's only three things that you can serve. You either serve yourself, you serve Satan, or you serve God. <coughs> These two get you nothing. These two might get you a lot of money. Blink, chips, honeys, whatever. <laughs> the respect of that. I can't see how a guy who's got 17 chains hanging around his neck, <laughs> with his shirt open, a lot of bling bling, a lack of car, can, can gain my respect, because I don't respect him one bit. Mm -hmm. If a guy, if God is the great I am, and I call myself Wall, I am, <laughs> you are not going to gain my respect. I'm sorry. And if God's name is Yaha Veha, and I call myself Ja Ru, God Ru, yeah. you're not going to gain my respect. I'm sorry. You can wear as much chains as you like, and you can buy yourself as much chips as you like, and you can swim in the pool on the video <laughs> and show your eight pack. You're not going to gain my respect. I'm sorry. Because you're lost, man. You're lost. If you think you are God who rules and you name yourself that and you're a man, you've got a problem. You've got a big problem. You are rule. Mm. But I'll marry Jenny from the block. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll be respected. Near hmm? like <laughs> Hey, people that suck anything in there. Eh? They believe in anything. Ooh, yes. <laughs> I'm going to get myself a shotgun and do a couple of drive-bys and gain your guys respect. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew 6, verse 19. Do not lay, for you, lay up treasures for yourself upon earth where moth and rust destroy. Lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy. Make a choice. Make a choice. Are you going to serve God? Or are you going to serve this world? And the things of this world? It's a choice that you've got to make. But right now, you've chosen, you're going to, a lot of people say, okay, I'm a Christian. But what do they do? What are their fruit? What does their fruit show me? That they spend 12 hours a day chasing money 
and one hour a week chasing God. But the fruits you all know, right? No, that's a Christian, but not yet. And you can judge me. I may not go to church, but I'm a Christian. Really? If you're a Christian, why would you not want to go to your father's house and visit him? I know, but I watch him on TV, the evangelist. Near Malcolm. That's what the, what the Lord said, eh? As you see the end approaching, gather together in front of your television. Is that what the Bible teaches? No, it says, gather together the more you see the day approaching because God's got a corporate word, word for His house and His family. We go to His house. Not to the guy in television. What does the evangelist do? You see evangelists on TV, huh? Evangelist brings a message, right? <coughs> he doesn't teach you. The pastor teaches you. Not so? Anyway, that's not Douglas. Alright, Matthew 7 15 says this. Mm -hmm. Beware of false prophets. You come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, etc. You see what I'm saying? So God says he's a Christian, he's coming to preach to you, but he doesn't even go to church, guys. Oh, come on now. Why would you even start listening to that? Where is he getting his message from if he's not going to church? You see what I'm saying? By your fruits. Come now, man. Get your wake up. Don't just believe what people tell you. Because he may have some knowledge of the Bible, but he's going to have a lot of wrong doctrine as well, which is going to slip in there. To try and put some weeds in there. That's why they do this, man. My counsel is no. I tell them straight up. Listen, I don't care what you say. I want to see what you do. Am I right? They're all not here. All three of them. That's why they fruit. I know, man. I come to death. You have not been tempted in any way that I have not been tempted. And I have not been tempted in any way that Elijah wasn't tempted. And that Jesus wasn't tempted. Because we can only be tempted in the same things. We're all flesh and we're all human. So I'm not talking down to you guys. I'm talking to you guys from a place of been there, done that. You know what I mean? I've been there and I've done that. And you've got to go through these things. But you've got to start showing fruit. You have to start showing fruit. Otherwise, I don't believe you are where you should be. And the only way you can start with showing fruit is by knowing what this says and falling in love with Jesus. Because it's by love that I'm going to start doing stuff, isn't it? I'm not going to start changing unless I love a person. If I don't see God as perfect and holy and I want to aspire to become like Him because I love Him, I'm not going to change, is it? <coughs> Matthew 19, verse 27. Are you guys getting something? Amen. The way I'm trying to get across to you is today, to make up your mind, guys. You can't flirt with God. You can't. Because then you can't say you love God. I cannot flirt with Linda and then say to her that I love her. Because what is flirting? Flirting is just dipping your toe a little bit and checking how far I can go with her, you know, what I can achieve, and how far can I get with her. <laughs> now I tell her, hey Linda, I love you. Is she going to believe me? Of course not. Because my flirting is going to be a little bit there and a little bit there. Mm -hmm. She's going to see me flirting also with Amanda and with Keisha. And now I'm going to come tell her, hey Linda, I love you. She's going to tell me, listen, bugger off, man. Would you think I am an idiot? By my fruit. She's going to judge me. By my fruit. 
You can't flirt with God. You either for him or against him, or you fool him yourself. You either are for God or you're against God. Don't fool yourself. God is not a 45 minutes on a Sunday, you come and, and listen to my word, and then you go out and you act like a devil for the other six and a half days a week. You're fooling yourself. It's a relationship, God. Isn't it? <coughs> so, sorry, I'm just using you as an example. See, I love Linda. Now, I see you on Sunday. <coughs> On Tuesday I'm working. Do I love so love Linda? Yes. Of course I do. So what am I going to do? I'm going to pick up the phone. How's it, baby? What are you doing? Blah, 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 blah. Right? I'm in contact because I've got a relationship with her. She's on my mind. She's part of my life. Mm. You see the example? Same with God. Is he part of your everyday life? Because if you love something or someone, surely your mind is on that thing. How am I going to keep her happy? How am I going to nurture her? How am I going to grow our love? Isn't that what it's about? See what I'm saying? So do you love God? That's the question. Good question to ask yourself, eh? All right, where were we? Matthew 19. 27 to 20 and 9. Um, yeah. Peter answered and said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man is sits on his glorious son, you shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, children, or farms for my sake, shall receive many times as much and shall inherit eternal life. Why? Fruit. <coughs> Fruit. <coughs> you are number one. Now, let me ask you ladies. Which lady sitting here does not want to be number one in their husband's life? Anyone? You want to be number one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Under God, obviously. Mm -hmm. But you want to be the most important thing in your husband or boyfriend's life. Are you guys listening? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've up, I've been through three. Marriages, not chicks. A lot more chicks. They want to be number one. How do you show them number one? How do you show them that they are number one? You spend time with them. You find out what they like. And you do what they like. Number one is you find out what their love language is, right? The love, love language is touch. Then you touch. You hug. You hold hands. Whatever the case might be. You are growing love. You have to grow it. Otherwise it's going to fade away. Isn't it? So you have to actually make an effort and give up. Because I'm not a touchy feely man. I'm a manly man. But if her love language is touch, then I am going to give up and touch. Hold hands. What in the case might be? I'm going to become this because I need to grow my love for him. Right? Same thing with God. I've got to become less and do what God wants me to do because then I'm giving fruit. I'm showing fruit. And I am proving that I love God by my fruit, not by my talk talk. See what I'm saying? It's only by fruit. Same as we said, we're going to test God. And it's by God's fruit and goodness in our lives that we are going to come to trust Him. The exact same thing is the opposite. It is only by the fruit in our lives that we're going to prove that we love God. 
und ganz gut zum Gute, mehr nicht ganz und nicht. Okay, Matthew 7, 24 says this. No one can serve two masters, either you will hate one and love one, the other, or you will hold to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and man. You can't serve God and you can't, or God and this world. You can't. You can't. Because if God says, I am your provider, and you are trying to provide for yourself, you are calling God a liar by your fruit. Isn't that? God gives you the ability to gain wealth, yes. And do you work for it? Yes. But is it you working for the wealth? Or is it God giving you the ability to earn the wealth, to gain enough for your needs, to give to other people, or are you accumulating it in the bank and uh, adopting the name of Zuma? No, just a joke. There's enough and then there's more than enough, isn't there? Mm -hmm. How much do you actually want? Because if you are aspiring to be a billionaire, then your mind is on the love of money. Mm -hmm. So you've got to draw parameters in everything, okay? Get a balance. Be wise. Don't say into this world. You are an eternal and spiritual being. This is just a blimp. In eternity. Alright. Revelation 22. Jesus is talking. He says, Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me. I'm reading verse 12. To render to every man according to what he has done. Get it? Fruit. Not to render to every man what he has promised. <coughs> not to render to every man what he has claimed, named it, claimed it, and framed it. Not to render to every man what he has said he would do, but to every man what he has done. Did you listen? Did you do the right thing? Because those are the things that are going to bring you the reward. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Those words that Jesus will say, right? And he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. In other words, your reward or your judgment is absolutely certain. It will happen. It will be because it's, it's, I am the beginning, I am the end. I cannot lie. I'm telling you now, my reward is worth me. I'm going to give you exactly what you've done. So that day that you lied to that chick, yes. to get whatever you wanted, <laughs> you're going to get a reward or one way or another. Did you do the right thing in the right circumstances? That is all that God cares about. He doesn't care about your comfort. <coughs> Although he does. He cares about your character. Character is concerned with integrity, right? So now what is integrity? Integrity is doing the right thing when no one is watching you. Right? <coughs> Guys, don't be confused. God is God. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. He does not change. Be careful. Be very careful. You get certain denominations who preach a Jesus of grace. Yes, Jesus is gracious. But grace has a limit. It is not limitless. And grace does not mean that you can continue to sin because you are now under grace. As many churches are teaching. Be very careful what Jesus deserves. I'll give you an example. Maybe I should be a bit too graphic. But there are churches out there who are preaching grace that the Old Testament God is not the same as the New Testament God because there is a new covenant. <coughs> you can sin, 
because Jesus died for us and be very, very careful of philosophies like that. All right, don't be confused. There are many false prophets out there. All right, so I hope you gained something today. Just to solidify your mind, get your mind and make a choice, guys. Make a choice. Because by not making a choice, you're not making a wrong choice. When you make a choice for the truth and start walking in it, that is when God can come through for you and show Himself faithful and true as you're walking. If you're standing still, He can't show Himself to you. How do I get a miracle? Unless I say, God, I'm trusting you for a miracle. Give it. If I stand here and say, God, give me a miracle, but I'm not slipping out in faith, why is it? Why would you do it? That's what I'm saying. Hello, my brother. Hello there. All right. Step out in faith. <laughs> what? All right, well, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity just to come and see how trustworthy you are, Lord. You are solid, Lord. If we build our house on you, we will never ever fail because you are our foundation and our foundation is truth and the truth shall prevail. We thank you for being who you are, faithful and true. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Have a look at that.